Hello and welcome to module 4 Connecting Smart Objects. In this module, we will discuss about communication devices in IoT and how we can actually use different communication protocols and different communication criteria for 5 different IoT domains. We will discuss in detail what are the characteristics, what are the requirements and how we can fulfill those requirements by adopting different communication technologies. Okay, so this is the lecture outline. We'll be talking about communications criteria, what are the characteristics and attributes we should consider when selecting or dealing with connecting smart objects. And then uh, we'll discuss some of the prominent technologies for connecting sensors. Uh, we are taking five use cases and we are actually just merging all these five use cases to understand both these things. So, essentially, whenever we talk about communications criteria, we have to take into account six different things. One of the things is range. What should be the range? For example, I'm using a variable device, its range should be one meter. But if I'm using a IoT device which is used for agricultural purposes, then its range should be about uh, 20 meters. So we have to talk about the importance of single proposition and its relationship with distance. Then we'll talk about frequency bands. Uh, we'll be talking about different bands starting from unlicensed spectrum until sub gigahertz frequencies and how those frequencies are assigned for particular applications. Then we we'll talk about power consumption. Uh, what are the requirements of power consumption uh, by our communication devices? Then fourth thing is very obvious that what kind of infrastructure, what kind of topology we are using for our communications. And in the end, we will talk about two important aspects. One is custom devices, uh, where we will look at the limitations of certain smart objects from connectivity perspective. And at the last, we will see constrained node networks, where we will actually look at the challenges which are often encountered with networks connecting smart objects. Now, I often ask this question, what is important? And my answer is always, everything is important. Uh, we cannot actually just pick one of the criteria and just stick to that. We cannot just think about range or we cannot just think about topology. We have to consider all these six things. Now, we'll be talking about some of the IoT access technologies. Mostly, we'll be talking about IEEE standards. We might talk about LoRaWAN, NB IoT, and other LT variations. And we'll talk about them in detail when uh, it will actually uh, be discussed. But since this is going to be a short course, and I'll be covering too many things in very short time, what I suggest you is to go and read chapter number four from the book IoT Fundamentals. Uh, of course, most of the slides are coming from that book, but I've changed many of the slides to incorporate our needs. Uh, but if you could read this book, and particularly if you read this chapter, then you'll get to know most of the things. So that is going to be your reading assignment. Uh, you read that and just Little bit off from this reading, I'm going to discuss one of the papers by a graduate student who worked intensively on uh, writing a thesis and uh, developed few pages. So I'm just going to refer to that particular paper and going to discuss next few slides. Okay, so these slides are based on both chapter number four from the book as well as the paper published by one of the graduate students uh, in this area. So let us start talking about communication because we are thinking of communicating with smart objects, connecting smart objects. 
So the first thing what we have to talk about is different types of communication. Now, there are three different types of communications which often occur around us. The first type of communication is human to human connection or human to human communication. Right now, I'm talking to you, although I'm using some kind of machinery, although I'm using some kind of uh, devices, but still I'm communicating with you. So it is a human to human communication where the information starts and ends with human being. I am giving some kind of information. That information is being transmitted through some, either you are using your cell phone or your laptops, either you are using a 4G technology or Wi-Fi, it doesn't matter. But information is starting from me and ending with you. So at the both ends, we have human being. So that is first type of communication known as human to human communication. Okay, now let us talk about second type of communication, which is human to machine communication. So of course, in earlier case, we had both ends occupied by humans. Now here in human to machine, one of the ends is replaced by machines. Now what are those machines? The best example which comes to my mind is ATM machine. The ATM machine has one end starting with a human being who inputs all the parameters and uh, we put all our details, we put in our pin. Machine takes decision, machine communicates with us and gives some money. So that is an example of human to machine communication. Another example is we use GPS systems, we put in some values, we put in some location and uh, GPS machine gives us instruction of how to navigate. Next example is traffic lights or perhaps lie detectors. Traffic lights signal or instructions are given by traffic lights and followed by human being. Or in lie detectors, signals are captured from human being and assessed by lie detector. So these are some of the communications where the communication is occurring between human and machine. So it is human to machine communication. And the third communication, which is of importance, uh, is machine to machine communication. So in machine to machine communication, uh, there is no human being involved. Both the ends are occupied by machines. So this type of communication happens because we set some kind of events, we set some kind of alarms uh, or triggers which are generated by sensor or timer. One of the best example is for uh, think of Amazon. Uh, I'm actually reading one of the books. Uh, I find it interesting, so I thought of actually purchasing it from Amazon. I go and click purchase button on Amazon. Once I click purchase, afterwards all the communication happens machine to machine. The first thing happens is uh, my credentials are established, my credentials are verified by machines. Then those instructions are sent to ebook server. Ebook server again receives those instructions and generates a token to download uh, the book as well as to process the payment. The token is used to download the book onto my machine, onto my cell phone, or onto my device automatically. And after some time, I can see that the book is available in my library. So here, the initial trigger was set by human being, but all the other processes were done by machines. Machine took payment, machine took uh, all the authorization details, machine downloaded the book. So that is machine to machine communication. 
Another example which I have written over here is vending machine. What vending machines do is if, uh, say for example, we have some beverages, some cold drinks, if the amount of cold drink goes below certain level, vending machine automatically sends a signal to these tokens to refill. Then that thing is automatically uh, <clears throat> communicated to the supplier. And then the supply is loaded into a particular box and then that box is delivered to the vending machine. So the initial three, four stages occur within machine to machine domain. And at the end, the final stage is taken care by humans. So these are different types of communications. Now, many a times people get confused between machine to machine communication and IoT communication. So just to mention here, machine to machine communication is used to connect different machines to each other. And they have been in existence for almost six decades, six to seven decades. Uh, one of the first machine to machine communication was used in uh, World War II. Whenever one of the soldiers had some issues, if some casualty occurs, automatic signal was sent by machine to other people's machine or to other people's receivers. And then they could trace out the casualty. So that was happening almost six, seven decades ago. So that was machine to machine communication. But is that IoT communication? No. IoT communication is much more than connecting two devices. As I mentioned earlier, IoT communication is all about ecosystem where data is generated, data is processed, business intelligence is uh, actually looked into it, and then cohesive action is taken to make certain decisions or do certain tasks. So essentially, M2M communication is a subset of IoT. In IoT, we do have machines communicating with each other, but the communication is intelligent communication. Communication is based on the parameters defined by intelligent object. For example, a CPU or a server, and server is giving instructions. So M2M is a subset of IoT. And in IoT, one of the most essential uh, communication technology which we use is wireless technology. M2M communication may happen through wired technology, but in IoT, most of the communication occurs in wireless technology domain. So then why do we use wireless technology? The obvious answer is, as I just mentioned in the morning, we will have about 100 billion devices which will be connected to internet. If we actually start physically wiring each of the device, then it will be too expensive, it will be too inconvenient, the devices will be immobile, and it is sometimes impossible to connect all the devices to wire. And that's why we have to use wireless technology. And the other thing is, uh, is, the, is the implementation. Uh, the difference between wireless and wired technology is that it takes place at two different levels. Uh, as you might be learning tomorrow, we'll have two different layers. Uh, one of the layers is physical layer in communication and the other is Mac level. Most of the times, the communication occurs for IoT devices through physical layer. So what happens is we use this uh, physical device for communication technologies. And I'll actually explain that in detail in tomorrow's session. So it is a good idea to use wireless technology for machine-to-machine -machine communication or for IoT communication. We can use 
physical device layer for uh, communication. We can also use Mac level as well if we want to go for more reliable communication. So we can actually use, uh, make use of the best possible scenarios. However, we do have some limitations. We do have some limitations on using wireless technology. And one of the major wireless technology limitation is the spectrum is very limited. For communication, either through Mac or through physical layer, we require, we use a radio waves spectrum, and that spectrum spans from 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. So we are very much limited into this spectrum of 3 to 3 kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. And then one of the major problems with uh, this particular limited spectrum is the interference. What we can do is we can actually use all these frequencies for communication. But if we start using all these frequencies, they might interfere with us and then the data can be lost. So interference is one of the things which limits the use of wireless technologies. So one of the ways to overcome this interference is to go for multiplexing. So multiplexing is a tool by which we can get rid of this interference and make still use of available resources. So here are four different types of multiplexing. I don't want you to actually just go deep into that, but I'm just actually trying to give you an overview of what happens. So we have four different types of multiplexing to avoid interference. The first type of multiplexing is a very obvious multiplexing. We call it as space division multiplex. So it is the easiest way to prevent interference by just ensuring that two radio waves are not in range with each other. For example, if we are using one frequency in Pune and if we are using the same frequency in Bhilai, we can still use that because the signals from Bhilai are not going to interfere with signals in Pune. So that is known as space division multiplexing. So without altering signal frequencies, we can actually use radio waves which are not in range with each other. That is space division multiplexing. The next uh, multiplexing is known as frequency multiplexing. Use different frequencies for different applications. So if I'm using 3 gigahertz frequency for one application, use 30 gigahertz or maybe 300 gigahertz from some, for some other type of communication. So we can do frequency multiplexing. Thing. We can use different frequencies for different applications or for different purposes. The third one, which is quite interesting, is time division multiplexing. So what we can do is we can use the same frequency at the same location, but we can actually use that frequency in different time windows. For example, we can use one of the frequencies at one of the locations from five to six. And afterwards, we can use the same frequency in the night or in the afternoon at some other time. So we can use uh, the frequencies, we can use different signals in different time windows. And the last one, which is quite again interesting, is to make sure that we use different pseudo random codes which can be encoded with some information so if we are encoding our signal with some pseudo random codes then we can actually use multiple frequencies or we can use same frequencies at the same location at the same time only thing is all these uh, frequencies are encoded so unless you get a key, unless you provide a code, it will not actually be accepted. And that is the most commonly used technology in multiplexing. 
So now once we know what is multiplexing and what is the problem with interference, now let us actually look at what are different frequency ranges and can we use different frequencies for certain applications or not. So for that, I have a nice table over here. I have frequency range starting from 6.764 megahertz going up to 246 gigahertz. So we have different frequency ranges. And those different frequency ranges are used at certain locations. For example, there are certain frequency ranges which are used worldwide. And then there are certain frequency ranges which are used in only region 1, which is US, or in region 2, which is Europe, and uh, in region 3, which is India and China. So we have availability of these frequency ranges. And they this are defined license users for that particular frequency range. For example, if I have two four gigahertz to two, but it is used only for fixed mobile radio location, amateur and amateur satellite devices. So it is used only for that uh, purpose. <clears throat> If we are using 244 gigahertz to 246 gigahertz, then it is again used for radio location and it is used for radio astronomy and amateur satellite services. If we are using frequencies in megahertz range, then we can, or if we have a range of, say, I'm just looking at one of the regions. Yeah, so 433.05 megahertz range, then it can be used only in region one, subject to local acceptance. So it cannot be used anywhere else. And it can be used in some of the locations defined by the chart. It can be used for amateur services as well as radio location services, but it can be used in only region one. It can also be used in Australia, by fulfilling some uh, different uh, norms. Okay, so all these frequency ranges are actually used for different applications and we call them as ISM band. So it is industrial, scientific and medical band. And that frequency is used for uh, different applications. So now let us look into these frequencies, this multiplexing and wireless technologies for five different application domains. What we'll do is we will look at five domains, which is variable sensing device domain, or we also call it as body area network. Then another application domain, which we'll talk about is smart home. Then we'll talk about smart factory, industry 4.0, as we discussed in the morning. And we will talk about smart grid and logistics. And for all these application domains, we will ask four questions. What the domain is. So we'll use some kind of introduction to application domain. Then we'll try to understand the characteristics of the domain. And then we will see what are the underlying communications requirements. And then once we understand their requirement, how we can use different technologies to fulfill those requirements. So that is what we'll do for each application domain. Okay. But before that, I want to show you a very nice chart, which is very dear to me. Uh, if you could see it clearly on your screen, that would be great. But just to mention, we have on x-axis a range in meters. And on Y axis, we have data rate. And that data rate is a megabit per second. Okay. And what it is showing is different types of communication technologies which are present uh, in which uh, in recent times. For example, we have Wi Fi. So if I go to Wi Fi, then Wi Fi range is about. Uh, 10 meters, 10 to 100 meters. 
okay and uh, its data rate is about 100 megabit per second if i go to satellite the satellite's range is typically few kilometers to few hundred or few uh, few hundred kilometers and its data rate is about 1 megabit per second we have bluetooth which is over here it has a very wide data rate from 1 to 50 megabits per second however its range is very small its range is about few meters we have nfc near field communication its data rate is quite high 1 megabit per second but its range is only few centimeters so unless it is very close will not have any communication option. so this is the chart what i will recommend you is to just print this chart and uh, post it on in front of your table so you'll get to know what are different technologies and what is their range and what is data rate now all these things are also summarized in a nice table so if we look at this table i know i'm making this very small but uh, what i'll do is like i just make it a little bit bigger yeah now we can see it properly so we have technology for example we have nfc zard links ncm bluetooth ruby wi-fi all these technologies are mentioned over here then we have mentioned what kind of standards they follow for example zard link has their proprietary standard on bluetooth we go for 802.15.1 1.15.1 standard uh, for Zigbee. Again, we go for 802.15.4 standard. Then we have frequency ranges over here. For example, Bluetooth uses 2.4 gigahertz frequency, whereas uh, Ruby uses 131 kilohertz frequency. So we have technology standard they use, frequency they use. The frequency they use, then it's data range. What data rate uh, they can communicate with? For example, ANT can communicate with one megabit per second, whereas for Zigbee it is fifty kilobit per second. And then we have range. So range is how far the signal can propagate. So it is twenty centimeters to. 100 meters and beyond that so we have a range and we have application where it can be used additionally additionally we also have categories category one two one 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 two 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 or if i go to next one we have category two three five four all those things so interestingly all these categories are for are five different application domains when I say category one, then it is for body area network or variable devices. Category two is smart home. Category three is smart factory. Category four is smart grid. I'll talk about smart grids very shortly. And category five is logistics. So say for example, if I'm on Zigbee, then for Zigbee, it is category two, which means it is used for smart home applications. For wireless heart, we have category three, which means it is used in smart factory. Category five is used for logistics. And category four is used for smart grid. OK, so we have different technologies, the categories, standard, their frequencies, data rate, range, and application. And we'll be referring to this table very often in this class to understand how they can be used for different in different application domains let us start with first application domain which is very dear to me because i work in this domain which is body area network okay so what we studied in the morning is that body area network essentially comprises of some of the devices which are on to your body for example, we have different sensors on your wrist, onto your toes. We have some devices which are implanted. For example, <clears throat> we have some heart implants, or perhaps we might have some other types of implants as well. Hmm. So the purpose of this 
body area network is to make sure that it gathers all the information from sensors which are close to body and then use an aggregator such as smartphone to take that data and send it to cloud and to internet. Uh, now some of the body area network devices can be worn directly like Apple Watch or Fitbit or like smart glasses or maybe we can use them on our sensors or we can put them under skin as well like smart pacemaker. So we'll have some devices which are on skin and some devices which are under skin. Okay, so that is a body area network. Now let us look at what are the characteristics of this body area network. So one of the characteristics of the body area network is would be using very low CPU power because the main task, important task is to collect the data rather than process the information. For example, for smart pace maker, it should be collecting only data. It need not have to uh, process all the data on the go. Okay, so they should use low CPU power. The other thing is they should use low power as well for communication. Because say for example, in case of smart uh, pacemaker, it is within your body. So you cannot actually remove every day and put a new battery. So they have to use in a low power mode. Uh, the other thing is the variable devices has very small size. So the battery size is also small, which means they should be using very less power. So that is one of the requirements or one of the characteristics of body area network. Now, the other thing is, unfortunately, there is no line of sight between several body area network devices because those sensors will be either under skin or even though if they are on skin, they might be under our clothes. So there will not be any line of sight. So they'll be blocking the sight. So there is no line of sight communication between uh, devices and aggregator. And lastly, all these devices are health critical. For example, again pacemaker, if the pacemaker is not properly working, then it might actually uh, be a problem for patient's health. Or for example, if the Apple Fitbit is giving wrong information about your pulse rate, then it is again a problem. So these devices are health critical. They have to give proper information. They have to give timely information so that we can take immediate actions. So these are the requirements, communication requirements for body area network. Or these are the characteristics. So based on these characteristics, we have now some communications requirement. Now, what are the communications requirements? The first is communication needs to be power efficient because the size of battery is limited. The communication has to be reliable communication because all these uh, devices are health critical devices. They run health critical applications. Okay, so there has to be a reliable communication. So power efficiency, reliable communication. And the third one is, which is very important is they should be foolproof of any kind of interference. If I'm using two or three different types of devices running on the same frequency, they're all very close to body. So it is very obvious that there might be some kind of on-body and off-body communication. We can have off-body interference. For example, me and my family members, if we are sitting together, then there might be some kind of interference between different body and network devices. For example, like this, this is me, this is my spouse, this is my brother. If we all are sitting together, there might be some kind of interference. So that is off body interference because I'm wearing too many devices. Even my family members are also wearing too many devices. Or we can also have on body interference. For example, I'm on the same body network, but I'm using three or four different devices 
using the same aggregator. So whenever we are actually defining or designing any communications, we have to make sure that we think about off-body and on-body interference uh, as a prime requirement. And lastly, we should have the communication which is interoperable communication. For example, for pacemaker, I might be using proprietary communications and for uh, my variable device, I might be using IEEE standard. Because they are different because I'm buying those variable devices from different vendors. One I'm buying from Apple or Samsung, other I'm buying directly from uh, the private vendor. So this would actually result in vendor locking. And so those communication criteria will be then very much proprietary and we have to depend every time on the vendors to unlock them. So interoperability is one of the keys for making sure that we have proper communication. So now what are the communication criteria we are going to then suggest? So the first communication criteria which we can suggest from this table is the category one communication devices. I'm just actually going to crop them and make them a little bigger. Okay, fine, perfect. So we will be using these five communication technologies for body area network application. The first one is Zarlink. It's a proprietary uh, technology, uses their own standard, works in 402 megahertz. Uh, it has uh, 200 to 800 kilobit per second data range, and it is used for implants. We have <coughs> Sensium, which is used for low bandwidth variables. We can use Bluetooth for high bandwidth variables. We can use ultra wideband, for very high bandwidth variables because their data rate is very high, almost 110 megabits per second, ultra wide band. And we can also use ANT technology for the same uh, applications. So these are the five communication technologies which we can recommend for body area networks or variable technologies. So let us actually talk about two of the technologies. We'll talk about Bluetooth, and we'll talk about ultra wide band. So Bluetooth, we all know, it has the most established standard. We use IEEE 802.15.1. It operates on 2.4 gigahertz band, and its data rate is about one megabit per second, and a range of about one to 10 meters. Uh, fortunately, it is supported by every cell phone technologies or every cell phone manufacturers in the market. So if you have a cell phone, it is sure that like you have Bluetooth technology. The good thing is like it has very high data rate. So even if we have to actually uh, communicate a big chunk of data, we can actually use that. Now we can also use ultra wide band, uh, which is again based on several standards, but None of the standard is well established. It again operates on a, a frequency range of about 3.1 to 10 gigahertz. It's quite wide and data rate is very wide, very high, 110 megabits per second. And the range is similar to Bluetooth, which is 10 meters. Now, earlier we thought almost 10 years ago that ultra wide band will become a very popular technology but its use is diminishing day by day and uh, it is not one of the prime choices nowadays for launches. okay so of course here the clear winner for variable technologies is Bluetooth devices now let us go for second application domain which is smart home okay uh, in body area network, all the devices were on the skin, under the skin. So the relative distance, although it was fixed, 
as a body area network person i could go from one place to another place so i could go from my office to my home to a park to movie theater so i could go from one place to another place so one of the prime requirements was that they have to be battery operated but the good thing about smart homes is most of the devices which we use in smart home they don't change their space for example the location of your fridge or refrigerator very often or you don't change the uh, location of your television that often so in smart home technologies most of the devices are stationary devices and smart home devices focus on end to end communication for managing the home on themselves okay so smart home focuses on end to end communication managing the home itself example is smart fridge or smart refrigerator which automatically reports missing items to the grocery delivery service or we can also think of another area where uh we can use these devices and that is our garden so all the sensors in garden come under smart home technology so we can use different sensors to monitor the moisture or water level in a soil or perhaps uh, we can actually just see what is the level of uh, nutrients available in the garden so we can actually use those agriculture sensors or water sensors for smart home applications so let us look at the characteristics of this type of uh, application the first characteristics and which we are happy with is that all the devices are stationary so in many cases most of the objects could be wired however unfortunately there are still some devices which rely on battery power uh for the ease of use so like for example smart fridge and smart tv can be actually hooked up with our ethernet cable but just because like we have wifi technologies we rely on wireless technologies uh just to have one common port and to uh reduce the cost of uh, wiring and uh, other infrastructure changes <clears throat> smart home relies on huge quantity of sensors uh for example if we have say tv fridge refrigerator uh a uh, ac geysers so there are n number of devices which we use the quantity of sensors is very huge if we go to garden we have almost five sensors per square meter so there is a huge quantity of sensors so one of the essential characteristics is that the cost per device has to be very low because we are using too many sensors if we are using uh sensors which cost about 1000 rupees per sensor and if we are using sensors which are uh, 100 in number then i cannot afford uh, 1 lakh rupees for the sensors you know so we have to make sure that the cost per device is very low which means like the communication tools which we are using also has to be a uh, bit less pricey the third uh, fourth thing is since we are in a house and the last thing is there is a huge huge variety of applications in and around the home for example we have agriculture sensor we have water quality sensors we have temperature sensors so we have huge variety of applications or huge variety of sensors in and around the home and we have to cater to those all sensors using our communication uh, devices or communication technology <clears throat> so what are the requirements so one of the things is now we are talking about home so now from we are going from 10 meters to 100 meters so the range has increased so there is a increase in range increase in scale it has to cover the entire home uh 
now the next thing is since we have huge variety of applications and they work on different bandwidths as well so we have to think of something which has variable bandwidth or which has a quite wide bandwidth for example uh, we are watching netflix or we are watching youtube that requires the data rate of about few megabits per second whereas if we are actually thinking about a smart refrigerator or perhaps a small agriculture sensor then it will require just one bit or five bit per second or maybe less than few kilobytes per second so we have a huge range in uh, data rate and the third thing is it has to be interoperable uh, so my refrigerator is from Samsung, my TV is from LG, my uh, AC is from some other vendor. So I'm using devices from different vendors and I want to make sure that like, they should be connecting to my communication hub very flawlessly. So these are the requirements. So what are the things which we can uh, use one of the technologies which we can use or one of the technologies which we can recommend is a Ruby technology. This Ruby technology is quite interesting. Uh, it was actually developed for smart gardening and fortunately it uses IEEE uh, standard. We have Wi-Fi, we have Zigbee, we have RFID. for access control and identification and we have ductually and z wave so out of that we're going to talk about uh, two three communication technologies which we can recommend to our applications one of them is ruby which is based on ipple standard uh, works on relatively low frequency range of about 131 kilohertz frequency and data rate is quite low so that we can uh, use it for applications such as water level sensor or perhaps LED sensor. Uh, the good thing is it has a range of about 30 meters so which is not since it uses frequency range of about 131 kilohertz the signals are not attenuated with our metal. So we can actually very well use them for a very low to few kilohertz range. The next one is Insteon. Uh, we thought that like people will be using this technology quite often, but people have started using it at very limited uh, case nowadays. It operates in a range of about 900 megahertz range and offers the rate of about 13 kilobits per second. And it can be used for home automation, for example, light switches or motion sensing, or perhaps it can be used in, uh, which we can use for multimedia streaming or for any other applications like video conferencing at from home, work from home. Um, it is most established standard like is about. 100 meters, which is very good for, for all the applicant rooms or perhaps actually uh, working outside as well. <coughs> and the last one is Zigbee, which is again uh, based or built on top of uh, IEEE standard 802.15.4 standard, works on 2.4 gigahertz range and it can cover very large areas. So it is very well suited for applications such as smart metering. So a person who is actually coming to get your meter reading, for example, will not have to enter into your premises. That person can actually look at your reading remotely through his car. That one is the RFID, which is used for access control. Uh, it operates as at 160 to 960 megahertz range 
and um, the good thing is it works in passive mode it doesn't require battery therefore it is suitable for access control and identification at all times okay so for smart home we are not now choosing any one particular technology but rather we are recommending at least two or three different technologies for different applications okay so now what i'll do is like i just wait for five minutes i just take a break for five minutes uh if you have any questions you can ask me question i'll be here i'll not be going anywhere else uh but if you want you can take break for five minutes i'll be back in exactly five minutes okay
okay so is everyone back yeah i can see okay perfect very good okay so now let us talk about third application which is quite interesting uh, and that is smart factory or industry 4.0 okay so in case of body area network our range was a few meters in case of our smart home the range was few tens of meter 10 to 50 meters or maybe perhaps 100 meters now in case of smart factories we have a very large or wider coverage because our factories are bigger they are not located in small location but perhaps on few acres land so smart objects in our smart factory need to be covered over a wider coverage that is first requirement for smart factory another thing is since we are working in a factory uh, which generally get thicker or more walls for example we might be having section a b c d in a factory all these sections are separated all different rooms are separated by thicker walls or more walls and many times those walls are made up of metal or metal sheets so if we have walls made up of metal or metal sheets then that is one of the challenges for our communication tools or communication criteria. the next one is we have a huge building we have many many walls so there is no line of sight like in other cases as well and but the good thing is these factories are managed by big companies and since big companies manage those factories we don't have any financial constraints we can go for a little higher financial budget so that is good thing so based on those four requirements these four characteristics now let us communication criteria which uh, we have to think of so let us talk about now communication requirements first requirement is that we have uh, we need excellent coverage and there are some walls so we should go for some topology which is used for uh, this particular application the one is uh, we can go for long range network connecting all the sub areas or we can go for technology which supports mesh topology now here is a nice example of mesh topology we have nodes connected to the internet or to the LAN, and then all these nodes are communicating with each other so it's a nice mesh which we will create inside our building or inside the premises <clears throat> so either we can go for long range uh, which is also possible or we can go for mesh topology the good thing about mesh topology is that if one of the nodes is faulty or if something happens at one of the nodes then the communication can occur through other channels or other nodes so it can reroute the traffic so if one of the node fails then we can have a traffic rerouted to other nodes so that is good thing so whatever requirements or whatever communication technologies we are supporting or re recommending should have this mesh topology and for that we are now recommending uh, three different technologies along with RFID RFID will be used for access control and then we can use wireless heart wireless embers and dash seven so why we are using RFID because we have a huge factory and each factory will have hundreds of workers so we have to make sure that they have proper access and they are accessing the proper factory environments and we can keep track of their movement as well so that's why we can use rfid as an identity card the next thing what we can go for is we can go for wi-fi for sub ranges for internal ranges so it has a range of about 100 meters uh, so we can use Wi-Fi as a gateway for some networks 
will not work. But what we can do is we can actually have wired solutions in different zones. And from that, we can have a wireless technology like Wi Fi so that we'll have a better coverage. So, Wi Fi in conjunction with mesh topology will work. The next one is we can go for wireless embers. It has a range of about 1000 meters, which is very huge. And it operates as a frequency range of about 800 megahertz and offers a data rate of about 100 kilobits per second. So, since it has a huge range, it is especially suited for connecting sub networks or factories which are kind of open factories. For example, we might have a factory which is garment factory with very low little wall, walls or if there are no walls, we can use wireless bus technology over there for uh, our applications. Now, the next technology which we can use is Dash 7 technology. Again, uh, it has data rate of about 200 kilobits per second and uh, it has a range of about 2000 meters so which is good so it is comparable to wireless embus and uh, it can also be used in open factories or it can be used for gateway for sub networks with in conjunction with mesh topology network which we have already discussed now the next application which i'm going to talk about is already present in many of the countries in the west and even in india as well we have started slowly adopting this technology and this technology is known as smart grid technology smart grid technology we have an electric grid uh, which connects us to the power plants so essentially this grid system consists of two different zones or perhaps I can make, call it as three different zones if we consider renewable energy. The first zone is power plants. So we have nuclear power plants, we have thermal power plants, we have hydraulic power generation plants, we have some solar farms and wind farms. So all these farms and power plants, they generate energy, they generate electricity. And that electricity is fed to factories, to houses, to offices, and to vehicles, uh, some electric vehicles. So it is essentially a combination of both stationary and rigid uh, network, which means, for example, factories are immovable, homes are immovable, cities are immovable and charging stations are also immovable and the power plants as well are immovable so it is characterized characterized by immovable uh, structures now one of the things about this smart grid is that it follows a communication tree type of uh, topology which means we get one line from power plant, it comes to a substation, from substation we send uh, or we divert the power to factories, homes, offices. If they are coming to homes, then we have again one substation. So we have a station, then we have substation, then we have sub substations and then we have hubs and from there the electricity comes to our home. So it actually uses a tree network to cover wide areas. Now, one of the other things is the smart grid is characterized by hourly peaks, especially in the households. For example, we'll be consuming more electricity during summertime for cooling our houses. We'll be using again more electricity for heating our houses in the winter, uh, as well as like we'll be using a lot uh, from six o'clock to nine o'clock in the evening. So we have some time hourly peaks where we'll have high consumptions and that demands that we are able to provide electricity to the proper demand. 
The next thing is we have some critical usage. Uh, for example, uh, we have airports, we have hospitals, we have schools, which require uninterrupted power supply. We should not have any interruption in power supply for critical applications, uh, such as hospitals and uh, schools and other things. So we have to consider all these characteristics, all these features when we define our communication requirement. So what is the first communication requirement? Obvious, we require a long range technologies. And the other thing which is required is whatever information system or communication systems we are using, it should have a short transfer latency. If some failure occurs, that should be reported to the main hub within fraction of a second, within few milliseconds. It should not happen that a failure has occurred and then it is taking few seconds or few minutes to get the information and to read out uh, the uh, power supply. So it has to have fairly quick uh, information transfer. It should be fairly scalable because we'll be keep on adding our customers. So for a small city, we might have thousand customers, but for cities like Delhi and Mumbai, we'll have some millions of customers. So our network should be fairly scalable and it has to be interoperable. So some of the communication technologies which we are recommending are wireless MBUS, Dash 7, Wetless is one of the things which we'll discuss uh, shortly, cellular technologies and WiMAX technologies. So let us talk about uh, what should be the topology of the network. Since we are keeping on adding uh, customers and we'll have stations and substations, so we have to use tree or cellular shaped network. So everybody is communicating if there is some fault at one particular thing, it has to be rerouted so that we'll have uninterrupted power supply. <clears throat> and for that, uh, we can actually go for some long range technologies like wireless MBUS and Dash 7 that can be used as aggregator for one area and those all aggregators will be connected to each other with tree or cellular shaped network. In addition to that, we can also think of cellular and WiMAX technologies. Now, cellular technologies, as we know, is a combination of all cellular technologies, right from JSM to 5G, which is coming in next few months to India. And it can have a long range of up to 10 kilometers. For example, 3G and 4G technologies are very long range. 5G technology may have limited range, but uh, it can be mitigated. <clears throat> YMAX technology can cover up to 50 kilometers. So it is best suited for big cities and it also offers large bandwidth. However, we should not actually rely on SMS or JSM for communicating with critical data because it is known that SMS has a long latency of several seconds. You might have seen that in your case, when you get OTP from a bank, sometimes it takes about two seconds to 10 seconds to get a OTP from a bank because we know that there is a known long latency of several seconds with SMS. So we should not be relying on JSM technology for communicating with critical nodes. <clears throat> okay, so these are some of the technologies which we can use for smart grid. And the last thing which I wanted to mention about is logistics. Now, logistics is one of the IoT application areas which is growing exponentially. Most of the jobs for IoT people will be coming in logistics. Now, why is it so? Because many, many people will be relying on IoT devices for sending and receiving goods. So what and where we should be using our IoT devices? 
we'll be using iot devices in logistics for monitoring the condition and quality of shipment locating the items within the harbor or within the warehouse we can actually use that for detecting the shortage as well as storage incompatibilities for example we can see whether like the object which is kept uh, or box which is kept is not in the uh, inflammable zone or it is not, not in the wet zone so we can actually just monitor that okay we can also actually monitor the uh, or we can also track the fleet so if the fleeting is moving from one location to another location for as example if it is going from raipur to ahmedabad we can actually track like how the package is moving so we can do general tracking of the fleet using our iot devices but unlike smart grid or unlike smart home one of the characteristics is that logistics is made up of highly movable items for example i have a packet moving from new york going to san francisco so it is actually moving on a land if we are sending that package from new york to say mumbai it is actually traveling on land on sea and through air so these objects are highly mobile all the shipments are mobile they are not at least stationary but there are few stationary components as well for example harbor and warehouses or devices used to find the shortage of supplies so that can be stationary so it is a combination of both stationary as well as non stationary items and for that we have to make sure that our network our communication tool supports both mobile as well as immobile operations so we have to make sure that the communication is either battery powered so that we can actually deal with highly mobile packages or highly mobile shipments and we can also provide some kind of wire technologies for warehouses and uh, harbors <clears throat> many times what happens is when a shipment is being transported from one location to the other it can or it usually goes off the grid for example if it is on sea or if it is in the air then we don't have any cellular coverage or we don't have any other coverage so many a times our shipment or our iot device goes off the grid so we have to consider that as well now there is a huge variety of different smart objects in the domain of course we can have a small shipment to perhaps a car or perhaps actually we are doing a uh, tracking of our fleet or we are actually monitoring the conditions of a warehouse so we have a huge variety of different smart objects in this domain and for that we should actually look for three different requirements one of the requirement is long range communication second requirement is scalable and third requirement is interoperable and for that we are actually uh, recommending almost six technologies we are recommending rfid wireless mbus dash 7 wetless cellular wimax and satellite okay so let us see what exactly we mean by all these technologies and as i promised we'll also see what is the wetless seven technology it is a quite interesting technology so we can use wireless mbus and dash seven i have already discussed cellular i have already discussed wimax discussed already let us talk about satellite satellite has a very wide range it has a range of up to 600 kilometers and it can be used for off the grid environment for example if we have a shipment on an aeroplane we can track that to satellite or perhaps actually if it is on ship it can be tracked to satellite so along with cellular wimax wireless mbus 
we can also the satellite for tracking of our shipment. Now there is another technology which is interesting technology known as wetless saver technology. It's a very odd technology. A uh, few years ago we thought that like it will get very popular, but unfortunately its use is diminishing in recent years. But that's okay. But the key feature of this wetless saver technology is that it operates in the wide spectrum region. Now, what is wide spectrum region? So we have certain frequencies which are allocated to one of the services, broadcasting services, which are not locally used. And that's why they can be used by secondary devices without interfering with the primary network. For example, we have a frequency range of about 900 to 10, 900 megahertz to 950 megahertz range allocated to Airtel. Now Airtel is not operating in one of the locations. So that particular frequency band can be used by other services in that particular region. So it is known as wise space spectrum. So although the spectrum is allocated to one particular service, that service is not using that particular frequency at that particular location so we can use that service or we can use that frequency at that particular location so that is known as white space spectrum okay so it can offer a data range of about 16 megabit per second quite high and it covers a range of about five kilometer which is good again uh, however it is dependent on location because Every time we have to look for white space availability. But if it does get white space availability, then it is very useful for low reception environments as well. Because it doesn't belong to one particular frequency spectrum, it can actually keep on changing the spectrum and it can keep on looking for white space spectrum. However, uh, in case of logistics, there is no dominating technology which we can suggest. We have to suggest multiple technologies uh, if we are working in logistics. Okay. So let us summarize whatever we discussed so far. Uh, so we discussed five different technologies. We've discussed five different application technologies, applications, and then we studied different communication technologies and we studied their requirements. And we found that there is no single technology that can be used for all the tasks. So we have to use multiple technologies, multiple communication technologies for particular application. And one of the th things which is very common and which is popping again and again is that interoperability is the major issue with IoT devices. Most of the communication criteria, communications are not interoperable and we have to make sure that in future, we standardize all the communication so that all devices become interoperable. Okay, so that is what we have seen so far. So we know now what are IoT devices. We know what are smart things in smart sensors or IoT devices. And we also know how to communicate or how to connect our devices to a network using different technologies. So tomorrow we'll talk more about how to get data out of the sensor using these technologies and then how to process that data safely and securely for our applications. Okay, so I'll stop here now. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me now. If you don't have a question immediately, what you can do is you can send me an email to this email, mubarak at iitp.ac.in. So feel free to send me any emails. You should have my email address, uh, which I have sent you during the invitation of this um, Google Meet link. And uh, I'll see you again tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. So just take rest and take care. Bye bye.